Welcome to the inaugural edition of Conversations with Claire. I'm so honored to be hosting this Q&A series with some of today's most inspirational leaders that have left an indelible impression on Emory and in many instances on the world. Today, I'm honored to be joined by President Jimmy Carter. I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. Our commitment to human rights must be absolute. Our laws, fair, our natural beauty, preserved. The powerful must not persecute the weak, and human dignity must be enhanced President Carter, can you talk just a little bit about how living by personal principles has helped you to navigate changing times? I don't think there's been any generation in my lifetime, at least, that has more changing times than the current generation of college students. And the principles that uh, guide us are individually chosen. As we go through life, every day we decide, this is the kind of person that I choose to be. And that's not affected by our parents or teachers or anybody else. We make that decision. I choose to be a person who clings to a principle of, say, generosity and kindness and concern about others or telling the truth or lying. So we make decisions about those. And, and over a period of lifetime, we accumulate a certain principles that, that we adopt and, and uh, to which we adhere and they are the ones that guide our lives. And I think that every individual is shaped by those basic principles that never change. They may be based on your religion or whatever. And, uh, and, and I think that's what makes us the kind of person we are. I'd like to talk a little bit. You now are a tenured professor at Emory. You have been a professor at Emory for a very long time. For decades have you been interacting with our students. You have taught them about principles. You have helped them figure out how to look at the world. And is there something from your perspective in today's generation of students that we, you would feel it's something that they need to prepare for, that maybe they need to focus on, especially since we seem to be living in what many of us call a rapidly changing world? I think in this generation, there's going to be a, a very serious problem with uh, global warming and climate change. And that's going to affect the life of everyone on Earth and including the people in the United States, particularly along the coastal areas. So that's something for which we're going to have to prepare. We've been reluctant, I think, or recalcitrant in not addressing it earlier. Another seminal change that will take place for Americans, during my lifetime, we've been the dominant you know, nation on Earth, militarily, economically, socially, and otherwise. That is going to change. Uh, maybe not militarily, we might still be the strongest nation militarily, but uh, as economy, I think China's going to become number one in the next few years. Uh, culturally, America's losing its, its dominant position. So the current day American college student graduates are going to be finding a need to be more flexible in dealing with other people. We might have to accommodate ourselves to other languages and other, and other leaders on Earth in different aspects of life. And that's going to be a different in the United States. But, but their basic principles of truth and honesty, uh, caring for others and so forth, that, that will never change. If you were coming in as an undergraduate student, what would you want to study? My life has been shaped by politics. I think I would consider law. My mother was a registered nurse, and, and, I, and the Carter Center has a major factor uh, role to play in international health care. So maybe preventive health care or medicine would be another law of medicine. I've made my living for the last 40 years uh, writing books, so I, I, you know, English literature might be an, another thing for me to adopt. So, so I would have to be quite flexible. Well, you sound just like the young people that are thinking about coming to Emory. They want to make a difference in the world, and they don't necessarily just want to do one thing, but really put together a package that they well, prefers them that, for the world. Well, the modern day student has to deal with a rapidly changing social world as well, and, and even dealing with the news. And, and 
I think, I think maintaining freedom of speech on a college campus is one of the main contributions that you all can make, uh, that we can, we can make, I should say. We got to college even dominated by maybe our fam family back home, and we choose either to watch MSNBC or Fox. But, but we, we decide ahead of time what we believe and we want to get news that helps us maintain our, our current beliefs and not to be challenged. That changes in college and for a very beneficial thing. One of the main characteristics of a leader is the ability or inclination to understand more than one point of view. Because when you get to negotiate a peace agreement or, or even to resolve a dispute in your own family, you have to be able to look at two or three sides to an issue sometimes. And, uh, and, that, and that flexibility and, and understanding other people uh, is, is a very important attribute for a college graduate or for anyone else. Yeah, and, and just listening to your answer, like you said, it's important for everybody to sort of step back and think about that, and right? We all have That's our true. opinions and we have our views. Well, on a college campus, you, you very quickly find that your professors are gonna have different opinions about the same subject, right. and, and all your classmates are gonna have different opinions too, <laughs> so, you, so you have to learn how to be flexible. That's right. So that's, that's one of the sometimes unpublicized advantages of a college education. I think it's just learning how to be more flexible and accommodating for different points of view. Yeah. And I've heard that you were one of our best teachers, so that's a real yeah. testimony, especially today, and you should take it as a compliment. Well, I, I do yes, take that yes, as a compliment. Yes, it's very important to me, yeah. the Emory. And for us. Now, as a leader, to shift gears a little bit, you've made such a difference in the, difference in the world. You're committed to making sure that we become a better place and I would say, although you may not feel that way all the time, that you have had tremendous successes for yourself, but for all of us. And those wouldn't have happened if you were not who you are. You also have experienced some disappointments, some setbacks. I guess that comes with if you want to move things forward, there are going to be people that will not understand, that will upset you, that might disappoint us. And how did those experiences make you maybe even a stronger leader than you already would have been without those setbacks? Well, I think one of the basic principles that we need to adopt is as you get to be a favored person in society, I'd say anybody that has a chance to go to a college like Emory is favored already. You have a recent ascendant position in life even when you're enrolled as a student, as a freshman at Emory, and, and, that, and that favored position increases your leadership potential. And I think to be a servant leader is a shorthand way to say what I really believe. The more favors you have been given by society to occupy a position of leadership, the more you should feel a responsibility to try to help those who don't share the same privileges that you have. So as you become a leader, I think you have to tell the truth so that the people that you lead will have confidence in what you say. And you have to be always attuned to what you can do as their leader to benefit the people uh, who look to you for guidance and, and, and leadership. And that makes me think about the season that we're in, uh, in, in our country today in the United States of America. We have, uh, we're moving into the presidential primary. I've season. heard about it, yes. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's gonna be impossible for us not to hear about it. But would you, from your perspective and based on your experience and your wisdom, have any advice for the candidates who have already announced that they intend to run? Well, some of them have already sought my advice, I have to admit. Yeah, that's one of them. I've had uh, three of the 20 or so Democrats come down to my Sunday school classes. I, I just advise them all to remember that you represent a, a broad diversity of people. You're not only president of Democrats, but you're president of Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. You're the president of uh, poor people and wealthy people. You're president of law-abiding citizens and those who happen to be in prison. And so you can't play favorites. And uh, I remember what Reinhold Niebuhr taught. He was my first I guess, philosopher that I ever believed in, a theologian. Uh, he said that the highest purpose of politics is to establish justice, justice in a sinful world. Well, you know, individually we can do much more than that. We can, we can base our treatment of other people not just on what's right and wrong, but also with a feeling of love and compassion 
and companionship. So I think that maybe our religious beliefs ought to be, you know, playing a major role in our future lives as well. Yeah. I'm so pleased to hear that people are seeking out your wisdom and you obviously have a lot of experience, but you're also the kind of person who is going to make, want to make sure that our next president is the kind of leader yeah. that we need. And they also come down to see me to find out how I got elected. Uh -huh. <laughs> so. Have you shared any of your secrets? Oh yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm quite free with my secrets. And, and when, when they got here earlier before the qualifying season started and asked me, I advise all those who came to see me, go ahead and run. It's a wonderful experience to run for president of the United States. I visited all 50 states and I got to know a lot about the American people I never would have known otherwise. I got to know a lot about the world in general that I never would have known otherwise. And we couldn't have been uh, near as, as successful as, uh, as a Carter Center as a part of Emory University uh, had I not been blessed with the experience of having been president of the United States and then able to apply some of what we learned to help other people around the world. Yeah, I can certainly tell from my own experience, even though I never will be able to run for the presidency of the United States, given that I wasn't born here, but I've learned so much from you about what it means to be a leader. Well, I'm not sure which is how president of the United States or president of Emory University. Well, let's have that conversation some other time. Yeah. yeah. I'd yeah. like to shift gears a little bit, if that's okay with you, and, and talk about the Carter Center and everything that you yeah. have done post your presidency. And I'm particularly thinking about the eradication of guinea worm, and, and now you've made incredible progress in diseases that people at times thought they would never be able, something that we could eliminate or even reduce. And then today we look up and we realize that was a measles epidemic, and that's closer to home. And we've had uh, an eradication of the measles since 2016, and now all of a sudden we're back to measles being a challenge. Any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, I have some thoughts because we had a measles outbreak the first, when I was first pre elected president in 1977 early. And we did two basic things. One is that we mandated by federal law that every child that entered a school in, in all 50 states had to be immunized against measles and other diseases before they entered the first grade. And all the states finally agreed to that. And we increased the amount of money to help the states pay for that from $5 million when I went into office to $35 million to, to just direct federal aid to, to the states to finance the immunization. So we increased dramatically uh, the immunization program and, and I had two women who helped me with that. One was my wife and the other one was Mrs. Betty Bumpers who was, who was the wife of Senator Dale Bumpers. And, and they helped a lot too. So, so I got everybody involved in, in, the, in tackling the proper immunization of children, which is very vital. Yes, it certainly is. Yes. In nice. our country and around the world. It's, that's true, it's important in our country and around the world. And I also love how you bring in your wife because as a team you're <laughs> incredibly strong when it comes to health, including mental health, and also how you bring the broader community in because together we can do much more than alone. Well, that's, that's one thing yeah. about about politics too, is to treat everybody equally. Yeah. And that includes men and women, and as the Bible says, slaves and masters, and Jews and Gentiles. Uh, you know, before God, we're all the same. Mm -hmm. And we should treat everybody equally and try to help those who are in need. Now, I've been asking you lots of questions, and I know we don't have unlimited time, and I wonder if there's anything that you may have in mind that you would like to share? Well, I want to be thankful for one blessing that the United States has always maintained ever since we were founded as a nation. And that is that our higher education system is so, is so good mm -hmm. and is quite widely available to the general public, although not completely yet. And I hope it will become even more widely available to all young people in the future. Uh, another thing that, that, we, that, that I'd like to mention is, is the fact that we have a, on earth a real need for peace. And our country has not always been at peace. In fact, in the last few years, uh, we've been terribly at, at war with uh, Afghanistan and, and with Iraq and with uh, Syria and, and with Yemen and, and others as well. And that has cost us a tremendous amount of uh, effort. So maintaining peace should be one of those principles that uh, 
and all of us strive to achieve. We can choose to alleviate suffering. We can choose to work together for peace. We can make these changes, and we must. I would like to see us have a, uh, a set of goals to uh, become a superpower related to peace. So everybody in the world that has an ongoing conflict in the nation would say, uh, why don't we go to Washington? Because the United States is known as the number one peaceful nation on earth. And why don't we go to Washington? Because the United States is the foremost leader in human rights. I think college students could do a lot to bring about those goals as the one that we seek as a nation. That's just incredible wisdom for the future generations and hopefully they will take some of this to heart and move forward. And President Carter, I have to say, knowing how much time you have spent over the last several decades at Emory University, how much of a key part you are of Emory, we're also so proud to have the relationship with the Carter Center because of you and because of your wife, but also because of all the amazing work that's taking place here. And I hope that together we will continue to push forward and make sure that we continue to have positive contributions. Well, one of the best partnerships I've ever formed in my life, except for my wife, was between <laughs> me and Emory University. And I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I've, I've benefited greatly from it and still hope to benefit. In a, in a few years, I have loved to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for giving the time, for being who you are, and for letting me be a part of your life. And most of all, thank you for leading with such compassion, because that's something else we don't see a lot. Thank you, Claire, very much. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I love you. Big puppy too.